Core. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Just going to share my screen. Um, good morning and welcome to Let's Talk About, sorry, dog. One moment. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Evelyn. Lay down. Sorry, I apologize in advance. There is a dog in the house and I have limited control, but I'll do my best. Um, welcome to Seniors and Owls. Let's talk about hearing loss. Um, but before I get too far into it, my name is Meg Viss. I am acting outreach coordinator uh, until Mary is back. And um, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the United Way uh, for their ongoing support and making uh, it possible for us to continue to do our Let's Talk and our Just Ask sessions. And before we introduce your speaker for today, just a little bit of housekeeping. Appreciate it if you could make sure your mics are muted. I'll do the, my best for myself here. Um, sometimes we get a little bit of feedback when we don't do that. You should be able to see captioning at the bottom of your screen. Let us know if that's an issue for you. If you could, if you have any questions throughout, we'd appreciate it if you could put those questions in, uh, in chat and uh, we'll be uh, following that carefully. Uh, this session is being recorded. And if anyone has any suggestions for future presentations, very much appreciated if you could send an email to maryE at seniorsnl.ca. You can also give us a call at 737-2333 local or 800-563-5599. And I'm going to pass it over to Barb to do the land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the land on which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beati, whose culture has now been erased forever. We also acknowledge the island of Uka Hunguk as the unceded traditional territory of the Beati and the Mi'kmaq. And we acknowledge Labrador as the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Inu of Nitasanen, the Inuit of Nunasi Abut and the Inuit of Nuna Tuaput. We recognize all First Peoples who were here before us, those who live with us now, and the seven generations to come. As First Peoples have done since time immemorial, we strive to be responsible stewards of the land and to respect the cultures, ceremonies, and traditions of all who call it home. As we open our hearts and minds to the past, we commit ourselves to working in a spirit of truth and reconciliation to make a better future for all. Thank you, Barb. Welcome. So um, just a little preamble, hearing loss is obviously a very important discussion for pretty much anyone at some point in their lives maybe, because the truth is that hearing loss can have a very significant impact on our health and our well-being, which John is going to talk about. It can certainly affect the social quality of our lives and, um, and in so create social isolation to some extent, even when you're surrounded by people, you can be socially isolated, which is a concept. It can possibly also affect the cognitive health of our lives. But the good news is, and John will go through this, that treating hearing loss can lead to a number of improvements in overall health. We asked you a couple of questions when you registered. Have you ever had your hearing tested in a public health audiology department, and it was close to a 50-50 of you have, and 50 approximately happened, 45-55. We also asked if you had ever purchased a hearing aid. Whoops, sorry. Uh, the hearing aids that were subsidized through the provincial hearing aid program, and only two of 47 have. So John, I'm leaving that information for you to, <laughs> to ponder. I'd like to um, introduce you to our presenter today, John Hillier. He's an audiologist with Eastern Health. 
a registered clinical audiologist at the Janeway in St. John's and an audiology consultant for Workplace NL. He has over 10 years experience working with adult and pediatric populations. He's been a mentor and a clinical supervisor to many audiology students over the years, as well as an advocate for individuals with hearing impairment. John's primary interests are hearing loss and hearing health care throughout the lifespan audiological rehabilitation, evidence-based practice, and improving treatment outcomes. So at that point, I think I'm going to pass this over to you, John, and I am going to unshare my screen. Thank you, Meg. And uh, thank you very much for having me today. And I'll just uh, share my screen there as well. Um, yeah, there we go. So, um, yeah, so thanks everybody for um, joining me today. As Meg mentioned, uh, I am a, um, an audiologist with Eastern Health. Um, I'm a, what's called a diagnostic audiologist. So it's, it's a little bit different than a private practice audiologist in that uh, I don't sell hearing aids. Um, I prescribe them and fit them um, under the Provincial Hearing Aid Program which is a, a government subsidized program uh, that many people can take advantage of, especially seniors. And um, a lot of the times they can get their hearing aids for free. Um, so um, with the outline of the um, presentation today, I, as Meg mentioned, I'm, I wanna talk about the impact of hearing loss. Um, that's the primary reason, I guess, that I want to present today. Um, in my practice, um, I'm kind of finding lately that there are a lot more questions that uh, people are posing. Um, and I figure that, um, you know, I would really like to address them and hopefully provide some answers. So I reached out to Meg a couple of months ago and, and, we're, and now we're here. So we'll talk about the impact of hearing loss, what an audiologist is, uh, what audiologists can do to help and a little bit about audiology in general. Um, so uh, Meg did uh, give the, the, the great introduction. I appreciate that, Meg. Um, and I'll just say a little bit about myself as well. I've, um, I've decided to use a picture of my family, which includes myself, uh, my wife, Amy, and my little girl, Faye. Uh, and the reason being is I think it ties into this um, presentation uh, because of how, um, how hearing loss can, it can impact the family. So, um, which I'll talk about a little bit in the next slide, but uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born and raised in CBS. Um, I'm an audiologist here at the Janeway. Um, I'm married to Amy, of course, who's a um, special needs teacher at Villanova. Uh, and my little girl, Faye is four now, and she just, she just started kinder start. So she enjoys dancing and, and, and school and daycare. Um, so here's another picture of my family. Uh, in this one, we've got my father, Rex, uh, my grandfather, and myself and Faye. So um, I'm just using this picture to kind of highlight how hearing loss can kind of um, impact individuals throughout the lifespan. So if you take um, the oldest, which would be my grandfather, um, he was an avid hunter. He, um, he was an engineer for Marine Atlantic. So he was around a lot of noise exposure his entire life. Um, he was diagnosed with dementia as he got older. Um, and often with dementia being a, um, a modifiable risk factor, hearing loss being a modifiable risk factor of dementia, I often ask myself if hearing loss played a role there. Um, we've got my dad. My dad is... Um, 65 years old, he's finding it increasingly harder to uh, hear in background noise, even though his hearing when he gets it tested is normal. But, you know, does this impact him um, socially? Uh, myself, um, I experienced hearing loss growing up because of multiple ear infections. Uh, you know, did that impact me uh, academically in school? And then, of course, my little girl, Faye, um, she's growing up in an increasingly louder, um, noisy environment uh, with, you know, video, with games and loud music and things like that. And we just need to be cognizant of that and uh, know when to protect our hearing. Um, of course, my mom is missing from this um, picture, uh, but um, she's kind of escaped the hearing loss aspects, I think, which, and she's lucky because most people, when they get up in, in that age, um, you know, they start to experience some hearing loss, but uh, just in case you're watching there, mom, I, I love you. And uh, 
you're not in there because of, because you haven't uh, you haven't experienced any hearing loss. So, <laughs> all right. So moving on to the next slide, um, it's just a couple of quotes from the World Health Organization report on hearing. Um, I've kind of added these um, because uh, hearing loss is becoming um, a really recognized impact on people's lives and. Uh, the World Health Organization recently came out with their report and have, you know, really trying to step up their game on how to treat hearing loss and uh, provide, remove some of the barriers for people uh, to obtain better health care services in terms of their hearing. So why is hearing loss uh, important? Why am I reaching out here? Um, Hearing loss is, is important. It's, it's one of the most frequent chronic conditions in adults. 90% um, of the oldest adults have hearing loss um, that can impact their communication. Um, it's one of the highest causes of years lived with a disability. And as we know, uh, the population of Newfoundland is rapidly aging. So, um, you know, hearing loss is certainly going to start to play uh, in, a role in people's lives as they age. Um, you know, one comment that a person made um, prior to the presentation was that uh, they've joined uh, this presentation today because their father is struggling uh, with hearing loss and they want to know uh, how that's going to impact them in the future. And I think there's a lot of people out there wondering the same thing. Um, so mismanaged and undiagnosed hearing loss can certainly have consequences, uh, can result in a poor quality of life cognitive dysfunction, depression, depression, reduced participation, and social isolation. And unfortunately, uh, many adults who have hearing impairment uh, do not seek help. And for the ones that do, uh, studies show that it takes around seven years uh, for someone with hearing loss to finally decide that they're, they want to do something about it. Um, and then when they decide they want to do something about it, uh, many uh, adults uh, with hearing impairment do, don't have uh, access to high quality audiological treatment or rehabilitation. And, you know, I, I really think uh, that these are things that we should try to improve on as, as we go forward. A lot of the times we hear that um, hearing loss is, is just a part of aging. And uh, historically it's, it's kind of been brushed under under the rug and, and sometimes laughed at um, you know we've all seen the um, the memes and the and the pictures of of the older generation you know with their hearing aids they're not working and that kind of thing um, you know but I think right now uh, that's starting to change um, we're starting to realize uh, the impact that it does have on our health um, Individuals with hearing impairment, in my opinion, they deserve the ability to communicate with friends and loved ones as they age, whether it be through hearing aids or other types of treatments, which we'll try to discuss in the, in the next couple of slides. Um, and of course, the inability to communicate uh, because of hearing loss can have a negative impact on friends and family as well. So there are, there are many causes of hearing loss, uh, as I mentioned, um, as we age, um, the incidence of hearing loss goes up. So one in three adults over 65 have some degree of hearing loss, and often it, it is quite severe. And then as we age, of course, it begins to progress. Um, and then into one in two adults over 75 having some difficulty hearing. Um, then when you start to bring in things like noise, uh, whether it be recreational or occupational, uh, that can make the hearing loss even worse. Um, of course, uh, hazardous noise is, is something that's been common to people in this province, whether it be um, through fishing or construction, hunting, that kind of thing. So as we age and the more noise we're around, the more, um, the more severe the hearing loss gets and the more it can kind of add up over time. Uh, other examples of um, things that can cause hearing loss, uh, medications, of course, uh, chemotherapy is a big one. Um, that needs to be monitored. Uh, there's certainly other uh, types of medications that can kind of uh, cause things like tinnitus um, and difficulty with, with balance that all kind of ties into your hearing as well. Things as, as, as uh, benign as wax blockage can cause hearing loss. Um, tumors, which are, are quite rare, but uh, can 
there are certain benign tumors that can cause hearing loss, actual physical damage to the ear, and, and then sudden hearing loss. Um, interestingly, um, we've seen some cases of sudden hearing loss occurring after the COVID vaccine. Um, sudden hearing loss itself is a medical emergency. And if you, know, if you do experience it, then you should get it treated right away. So there are many signs of age-related hearing loss. Um, of course, um, probably the most famous one is the speech of others sounds mumbled or slurred. Um, often we, you know, in my clinic, we, people, the husband will come in and say, um, you know, I can't understand my wife, she's mumbling. The, issue, the thing is though, it's about 95% of the time, it's not that the person that's mumbling, it's your hearing. Um, so anytime you um, recognize that things aren't quite as clear anymore, uh, that people are mumbling, it's good, might be worth getting it checked out. Of course, conversations are difficult uh, to understand, uh, particularly in background noise. Um, and then as we age, that's uh, the hearing loss begins in the high frequencies. So um, if you start to have trouble hearing high pitched sounds or if speech isn't clear, um, then it might be worth getting, getting the hearing assessment. And by high frequencies, I mean things like um, microwaves beeping, uh, smoke detector, that kind of thing. Um, what you'll notice if you have a high frequency hearing loss is that, as I mentioned, speech isn't clear anymore. And the reason for that is a lot of, a lot of the consonant sounds are high pitched and from the consonants is where you get your clarity. Um, with high, with uh, age related hearing loss, the low frequencies are fine. So you get the volume, but you, you lose the high pitch. So. A lot of the times people say that they can hear people are talking, but they don't understand. So a lot of the times people with hearing loss will use coping strategies. Um, they'll smile and nod, uh, they'll talk and, and, and not listen to what the person's saying. They'll say what, huh, a lot. Um, and the withdrawal of social and environmental um, participation. Uh, just as a personal example now, I'm, I'm 38 um, and I'm starting to find that even though my hearing is relatively normal, uh, I do have difficulty understanding my daughter uh, in the car and, and when she's in the back seat and I'm, and I'm in the front seat and I'm even starting to um, have trouble hearing my wife from the other room. Um, you know, as they say, uh, being married is 95% 95, 95 of being married is shouting what from the other room. Um, so no, again, continuing in the same vein, um, I think it's really important to know when to get your hearing assessed. Um, it doesn't mean getting your hearing assessed doesn't mean you have to get a hearing aid. It doesn't mean that, you know, anything's gonna be particularly wrong. I think a lot of the times people are, have that fear. So, um, but that being said, it's, I think if you're having trouble, it's worth getting it done and just to know where you're at and maybe have some, some information that you can kind of help you out along the way. Um, a lot of the times people with hearing loss, they'll find the television is loud. Um, they'll have difficulty understanding at the place of worship, uh, have difficulty understanding when they can't see the person's face uh, and you'll find yourself more impatient and irritable or withdrawn than before. You know, if it ever gets to that point, it's, you really need to decide that just to go get it checked for sure. Um, this is an interesting slide. Uh, what I have here is the hearing handicap in inventory for the el elderly. And I often use this in my practice just to kind of um, determine where the person is having trouble. But it can also, it's also designed to um, help you realize if you, if you do need to get some help or not. Um, so what it does, it has a, a list of questions there to evaluate um, your emotional and social score as it relates to your hearing difficulty. So you answer the questions, yes, sometimes no. Um, you add up all the points and then in the bottom, it actually tells, tells you the interpretation of the score. So um, if you range from 10 to 24, uh, this, uh, you, should, you should get some, you should get it checked out. The same with 26 to 24 to 40. If you're scoring zero to eight, uh, then there's probably only a 13% pro probability of hearing impairment. So, um, you know, 
you're probably doing okay um, and probably don't need to get it checked out at that time. But this is a great resource. And so if you, if you yourself or if, if you know somebody who's struggling, get them to fill this out score it and then you know go by the interpretation and see if they need any follow-up um, so some consequences of hearing loss um, it can certainly interfere with an individual's ability to be treated for other medical conditions uh, one we often see is diabetes which can be a vicious cycle um, diabetes has been shown to impact the person's hearing so, and to the point where it can get bad enough that they can't understand their doctor. So the person has diabetes, they have an untreated hearing loss, they go to their doctor um, and they can't understand what the doctor says about treatment. So they don't adhere to their diabetes treatment and then that makes their diabetes and their hearing worse. Um, you know, anytime that, you've, that you're having trouble hearing the doctor, it's time to do something about your hearing in my opinion. Um, as we've mentioned, it can lead to isolation, fatigue, physical health, cognition, and, and issues with your mental health. Um, cognitive decline and poor physical health are also uh, consequences of age-related hearing loss. So in this slide, we have Evelyn. Um, She's a 72-year-old lady who first noticed her hearing worsening uh, two years ago when she couldn't hear the microwave beeping and couldn't hear the television clearly. Uh, over the last year, she noticed that she was withdrawing from her family and friends, and she mentioned she was becoming standoffish and felt she was ignoring them. Her daughter convinced her to book an appointment with an audiologist. So this is a very common case. I uh, see it quite often in, in my clinic. So we took Evelyn into the booth and we tested her hearing and we found that she had a mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss uh, that was attributed to the aging process with a PTA of 45 in both years. And um, I'll, in, in, in the next couple of slides, I'll explain what the PTA is. Um, in terms of her treatment, it was a non, it was a age related hearing loss, so it couldn't be medically corrected. So we uh, recommended a hearing aid um, and for both ears. Uh, and now that since Evelyn started to use the hearing aids, she's been able to enjoy meals with her family uh, and return to playing cards with her friends and feels less lonely. So loneliness, I think, is something that we can all relate to, especially now during COVID. Um, of course, loneliness can have detrimental effects on our health, such as depression, uh, poor sleep, accelerated cognitive decline, impaired immunity, and um, increased blood pressure. And one of the points that I find completely amazing is that the effect of loneliness uh, on, your, on your health is similar to obesity and smoking. So that's, that's pretty incredible. So next we have George. Uh, George is a 70 year old man who worked in construction industry for 30 years. He began experiencing difficulty hearing in his late 40s and early 50s. Uh, he first noticed difficulty hearing in background noise, but his family has noticed that his communication has become impaired, and his doctor has noted that he's showing early signs of impaired cognition. He had hearing aids 20 years ago, but he stopped wearing them because they didn't work. So I think we all have friends who started off wearing their hearing, or, or family members that started off wearing their hearing aids. Um, found that they weren't quite getting, for whatever reasons, which I'll go into uh, in the next couple of slides, they weren't getting the benefit that they expected. Um, they probably, they might not have been getting the follow-up that they needed for it um, or the support and the hearing aids end up in the drawer. Um, and this is the case of what happened to George. So uh, we checked George's hearing when he came in. Uh, he had a slight to mild sensory neural hearing loss, so not a real great big hearing loss, but it was enough to impact his life. Um, again, we tried hearing aids with George, um, and he found that not only did he get an improvement in his communication, but when he was texted for his cognitive function again, there was also an improvement in there um, with the increased audibility. Um, hearing loss and dementia is something that's we're starting to see a lot of work being done on. Um, right now, there's no causal link between the two, uh, but we're certainly starting to see some evidence 
where hearing loss and dementia kind of coexist. Uh, for example, um, brain scans have been showing uh, that hearing loss may result in a faster rate of atrophy of the brain. Hearing loss can result in social isolation and lack of exercise, which can lead to dementia. Um, and the, recently, uh, the National Alzheimer's Project just added hearing loss to the list of modifiable risk factors for dementia. So uh, that being said, I really think that um, we need to find a way to increase uh, the access to hearing aids as for individuals with dementia uh, and, and disabling hearing loss, as well as to increase um, the higher quality hearing health care for these people. One way we can do that is, is try to find the ways to reduce financial barriers to hearing aids for this population. So um, just to get maybe um, you engaged a little bit, uh, I decided to do a couple of true or falses and you can maybe put it in the chat if you like. Um, so true or false, the best person to see about your hearing loss is an audiologist. And of course, that's, that's true. Um, a lot of the people I find that um, aren't quite sure what an audiologist is. So when I tell, it's, it's getting a little bit better than when I first started, but um, when I tell somebody an audiol that I'm an audiologist, usually their first response is what? And it means one of two things. Either they're making a joke or they actually don't know what an audiologist is. Um, so um, the scope of practice of an audiologist is that we're the primary health care practitioners who, ex who have expertise in the treatment, diagnosis, and rehabilitation of management uh, of hearing impairment. So we are the experts in this. Um, a lot of people in Newfoundland, they'll go to their doctor, they'll see an ear, nose, and throat specialist or a hearing instrument practitioner. All these people are trained in certain aspects of hearing loss, um, but audiologists are truly the experts. And as our professional association in America states, uh, to achieve the greatest probability of successful treatment, the management of hearing loss should be provided by registered audiologists. So when you go to the audiologist, uh, what should you expect? Um, initially, it's, it's your initial consultation where you have a discussion with the audiologist, then they'll assess you with a, a bunch of different tests. Um, one of those, of course, being the famous hearing, hearing tests in the booth. Then a really important aspect is the discussion of results. And, and this is where you get your, your chance to ask questions. You, you should, you know, once you get the results, you, you should really ask do you think hearing aids are going to benefit me? Are there any alternatives to hearing aids that you might recommend? Um, and then, of course, the follow-up visits if you get fitted with hearing aids, um, and they can be done as needed. Um, not only should an audiologist provide you with all these things, as a patient, you should really demand them when you go in. So uh, the next true or false is audiologists only test hearing and dispense or sell hearing aids. And I think, um, you know, um, that is the public perception of audiology. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, um, my role is more of in a healthcare role. So I, of course I fit hearing aids, but I also do rehabilitation, uh, recommend alternatives, uh, talk with the family about communication options. And, and I actually don't sell hearing aids at all. When you get them for me, they're, they're actually free. Um, these are all the different taking earwax out to uh, screening babies when they're born, um, advocacy, which is a big one for me, um, and you know, counseling as well. So it's a whole wide range of things that, that we do. So I, I guess the, the big question a lot of people would like addressed is, is about hearing aids. Um, hearing aids work. Uh, do they work for everybody? No. Um, are there pitfalls to hearing aids? Yes. Um, hearing aids do need to be fit properly to work. So, um, but as has been found in, in certain studies, um, they do have great benefits for a lot of people. Um, normally, in, normally in my practice, they are people over 65 
who are finding it extremely hard to communicate. Um, as I'll go in, in, I'll go on with this further, but um, in a later slide. But there almost has to be a desperation there uh, to want to be able to communicate, as well as as the type of hearing loss. Um, so if hearing aids work, then why don't we use them? Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons. As I mentioned, sometimes people just don't get the benefit from them if they're not fit properly, if the, if the proper follow-up isn't done. And what we had to realize about hearing aids is that they're, they're a crutch, they're, they're not a cure. So um, yesterday I noticed a gentleman uh, trying to get up um, Thorburn Road with crutches and um, you know his mobility was so poor and his desperation to uh, get around was so great that he was out in the middle of a snowstorm with, with crutches, um, icy conditions. And that's comparable to how a hearing aid works. So basically you almost have to get to the point where you have um, a desperation factor. Do you wanna be able to hear your family better? Do you wanna be able to hear your friends better? Uh, and then people find that hearing aids do have an improvement in that situation. And so um, comparable to a crutch or a cane, they're an aid, uh, they're not a cure. And, and with the follow-up piece, um, you can't just take a pair of, like glasses, you can't just take a pair of hearing aids out of the box and put them on. Um, so true or false, uh, invisible in the ear hearing aids are the best. And of course, that's false. Um, the reason I added uh, this um, slide is because one of the things that you can get from your audiologist is a recommendation on the best type of hearing aids for you and for your hearing loss. Um, and you should always discuss this with your audiologist and ask if there are any different styles that may benefit you more so than others. And of course, um, different, um, Different styles of hearing aids have their strengths and weaknesses. All hearing aids do the same things, but um, you know, of course, smaller hearing aids may be harder to get in, into your ears um, than the bigger ones, which is a consideration for people um, that may have arthritis in their fingers. So anytime they see an audiologist, you just ask them, is this the right style for me? Uh, in this slide, I, I just wanna just point out how simple a hearing aid is. Um, you know, we've all, I think a lot of us have seen the programs where they say it takes $60 to make a hearing aid. And, and it's true, they are fairly simple devices. Um, they have, they all have the same microphone, the same amplifier, and the same speaker. Um, it's the chip that's different. Um, however, you know, um, even though they only take $60 to make in a, in a factory, um, they can have a big impact on certain people's lives. Um, so when you go get your hearing aids, or if you finally decide to make that choice, uh, there are a bunch of different kind of uh, things to expect. Uh, and Developing realistic expectations is critical to success with your hearing aids. And this is something that your audiologist should do with you. Um, if you think that hearing aids are gonna help you hear um, or eliminate all background noise, then that's not a realistic expectation. Um, if you think that um, you can use your hearing aids two or three hours a day and get benefit out of them, then that's not a realistic expectation either. Um, Full-time use is important to get, uh, to get the most benefit out of them. They do take an adaptation period that can last up to two or three months. Um, but uh, once you get past that point and the brain adapts, uh, then, then they can certainly provide benefit. Uh, they can't, of course, and they can't restore your hearing to normal as you know it as well. Um, one of the big parts of me, of, for me in advocacy is, is informed consumerism and hearing loss. So a lot of the times the hearing aid market isn't rational. So um, when people come in and see me, uh, I hear horror stories about people being told that they're absolutely going to get dementia because they have untreated hearing loss, which isn't true. Um, yes, there is a connection there, but 
just because you have hearing loss doesn't mean you're going to get dementia. Um, another another um, piece there is saying that um, the most expensive hearing aid is going to help you hear better than the least expensive one, which studies show that there's no difference between how you hear with the most expensive hearing aid than how you hear with the most simple hearing aid. Um, also, uh, when you go see a, a private practice, sometimes alternative treatments aren't being recommended when they may be when they may be a better option for you. Um, and of course, you know, many, uh, many factors impact uh, the decision making of, of seniors, uh, changes in cognition, uh, the time pressure to make the decision and, and seniors sometimes can be vulnerable consumers. So I think to overcome that, we need to be aware that that this can happen if you go by hearing aids and you need to make sure that you ask lots of questions when, when you wanna go that route. Um, so in a previous slide, I mentioned um, your PTA. Um, and what that stands for is pure tone average. And if you wanna compare your hearing to vision, this is one way that you can do it. So when we talk about a person with normal vision, um, they don't wear glasses. Their vision is 20-20. So um, that would be comparable to a person with a PTA of zero to 40 decibels. Um, what that PTA is, it measures uh, the speech frequency thresholds between 500 hertz and 4,000 hertz. Uh, um, so you know, studies show that if you have a PTA between zero and 40, then hearing aids would be of limited benefit. You can just turn up the TV, use closed captioning, ask people to repeat that kind of thing. Um, once you get into more severe hearing losses of a, of a PTA between 41 and 60, it's possible you could benefit from hearing aids if you're having difficulty with communication. Uh, and then if you go to 61 to 90, um, you will have to, you know, it's reasonable to conclude that you'll have to rely on hearing aids for communication. And I think this is an important part. So if, if you're get your hearing tested ask uh, you know take this along with you and ask uh, the audiologist what your pta is and how you fit in here um of course just like except just like any rule there are exceptions um but this is a pretty broad uh guideline to go by i think so in these slides uh we have a computer here um that's called a Verifit. Um, there are different types. It's how we program your hearing aids to, um, to your prescription. If you go in to buy hearing aids and the clinic doesn't have one of these, you should turn around and go back out again. Um, this is the hearing aids being fit to your prescription is the most, is the indicator that shows the most amount of, of benefit. So if your hearing aid isn't fit to your prescription, then you, it could cause you a lot of different trouble down, down the road. Uh, the slide on the right shows how uh, we fit the hearing aid to the prescription. So um, it's actually a little tube that we put in your ear. Um, and then we put the hearing aid in and we play some speech over the computer. And what the hearing, what the tube does, it actually measures how the hearing aid um, is working in your ear. And it measures uh, the volume of the hearing aid at the eardrum. And then hopefully um, when we measure your hearing aid, uh, it'll match the targets. So in this diagram, you can actually see the little purple targets. Um, that's your prescription. So that's the gain of, of the amount of volume that you need at each frequency. Um, the line going through the targets is the response from the hearing aid. So um, if you can, um, if you can get the person to do this procedure with you, um, you should be looking at the computer um, and making sure that that line goes through your prescriptive targets. If it doesn't, then the hearing aid isn't fit properly for you. And you may have trouble uh, with things like hearing and background noise or hearing certain types of speech um, and that kind of thing. So um, those are just some kind, some measures that you guys can kind of um, put into place just to be um, you know, more informed consumers and hopefully get the most benefit out of your hearing aids. Um, and you know, in this presentation, if, if there's anything that um, I hope that you take away from it is, is that hearing aids can certainly help. Um, they can certainly help mitigate uh, the, 
the impact that hearing loss can have on your life, uh, but they need to be fit properly and they need to be fit to a certain prescriptive formula to get the most benefit out of them. So uh, that kind of wraps it up. Um, so uh, I, I can take some questions and comments, I guess, at, at this time. Thank you, John. That's fantastic information. Thank you. Um, there were a couple of, uh, of questions in the chat, so maybe I'll start things off by bringing those out. Um, wondering, John, can you speak about the treatment and financial supports offered by the provincial government to people who have hearing impairments? Sure. Um, so right now it requires uh, a referral from your doctor uh, to one of the regional health authorities uh, to come in and get your hearing tested um, by a regional health uh, authority audiologist. Uh, and once we have done that, um, if we find that, you know, um, you have a hearing loss significant enough for hearing aid, uh, we'll talk to you about that. Uh, and then if we recommend hearing aids, we will, um, prescribe them to you. Uh, and then if you qualify for the program, which is done through um, advanced education and skills, they'll do the financial piece. Uh, and once the financial piece is done and you qualified, uh, then we will hear back uh, that you're qualified. And then we will um, get you in for your hearing aids. And the, the hearing aids are free for, for the lifetime. The only thing they have to pay for is the battery. Um, of course, if the hearing aids are rechargeable, you don't even have to pay for the batteries. Um, a lot of seniors on, on fixed income, on uh, social assistance uh, will qualify, uh, and uh, anybody in long-term care that's subsidized will, will qualify. It's a great program. Uh, it, it's a real feather in the cap of, I think, uh, of, of this province. It's, um, and probably in keeping with that, is there a cap on financial support offered by the government with the purchase of hearing aids? Uh, no, uh, the hearing aids that you get are, are, are mid-level hearing aids, which is more than enough for, for anybody really. Uh, they're great quality hearing aid. Um, we come in, we'll pick out, uh, pick out the style that you want and we'll do the impressions. And, and like I said, there's no cap. Um, if you know if you want a more expensive hearing aid then you won't be able to get it through us but like i said the the type of hearing aid that we offer is great it's it's more than enough so thank you yeah. um susan haskell is asking what role if any does genetics play in hearing loss oh that's a great question um it's, it certainly can play a big role um we actually have a couple studies being done in uh, Newfoundland right now um, that are linking uh, certain families to certain types of hearing loss. Um, there's actually a gene that's been identified, I think, um, in the Bay to Spare area. It's called the Loveless Hearing Loss Gene, and, and there's been papers published on this. And people in this family have a, a genetic hearing loss um, that progresses it actually starts in the low frequencies and, and progresses throughout time to the point where they do need hearing aids to communicate. Um, and, it's, and it's a unique one to Newfoundland. So, so that's pretty neat. Um, you know, Anne Griffin is an audiologist um, at Memorial University and, and her and her team are doing a lot of um, work on a genetic um, type of hearing loss that is leading to uh, what's called otosclerosis. And uh, otosclerosis is a type of hearing loss where the bones of the inner ear fuse together and the sound can't get through the system um, properly, and that can result in hearing loss. So uh, not only does genetics play a huge role, in, and you know you can see it in, in families or different syndromes and, and, and that kind of thing, um, but not only does genetics play such a big role, um, but you know in Newfoundland there's it's unique. There's certain hearing losses unique to Newfoundland, just like just like anything else with Newfoundland. I guess it's we can be pretty unique, uh, unique, new, unique province. Um, I'm going to. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll go through some of the questions that were asked uh, upon registration, and then um, open the mics if we have time. Are you good with sure. that, John? Yep, yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Um, 
uh, is again, Susan, is there a wait list for hearing tests testing at the moment? Yeah, uh, well, um, it depends on the region. Uh, I'm not familiar with um, the other regions uh, outside of Eastern Health, unfortunately. Um, and there has been a wait list. There has been a quite uh, extensive wait list in Eastern Health up until recently. Um, you're, you know, for a hearing test, you're probably looking at a year at the, you know, at the minimum, which is, you know, which is pretty long. Um, but uh, we've done a great job of getting that down, and I think right now you're you're looking at a couple months. I, I think so. So uh, the wait list is starting to come down, which is great. And you know, if you know, I would really recommend that. Um, if you want to get your hearing test and you can wait, um, come see a public health audiologist and, uh, you know, I, I think that and we can go through it all with you. Um, curious as, okay, um, I'll just, this is uh, on the hearing aid, curious as to what options are out there for seniors who need hearing aid but do not have insurance. That's a great question. Um, so the provincial hearing aid program is a great program, as we mentioned. So that's one option. Um, unfortunately, recently I've been seeing a number of seniors, um, you know, who have a hearing loss um, that could and they could benefit from hearing aids based on you know their hearing loss and their history. Uh, they can't qualify for for the provincial hearing aid program, but they don't have enough income to you know. Um, spend five thousand, six thousand dollars on hearing aids. Um, there are alternatives out there, and maybe that's something that we can um, touch base on, Meg, to provide those. Maybe um, because there are a lot out there, and you need to be really careful about the ones that you are looking at. So there are cheaper options out there, um, but before you buy any on the internet, you, you got you should do a lot of research, um, you know, and that's somewhere that that's, I can come in handy there by providing some additional information if you would like. Um, but there are alternatives to even even if you just even if you have like an FM system, um, if you're having trouble hearing in your place of worship, uh, the you know the minister could wear the the microphone and you actually have a headset um, just to get you by at, at church or something like that. But um, you know, don't go without. Um, if, if you're having trouble, do some research. Uh, you, the other thing you can do is, is shopping around to other private practices just to see which ones have the, have the best prices as well. Okay. And so um, what we'll do is maybe after this presentation, if you're able to share some of that information, we'll send it on to everybody who registers. Sure. Um, uh, someone said that they had an acoustic neuroma tumor. Mm -hmm. That was treated in Winnipeg, but I have hearing loss in both ears. Yeah, I, you know, um, I might have pronounced the heck out of that thing. <laughs> no, that's perfect. <laughs> Acoustic neuroma is it's a benign tumor that um, that can grow on on the audio vestibular nerve and and kind of cut that nerve off and uh, result in in hearing damage. Uh, usually, only relate. It's only usually ever on one side. I don't know if I've ever seen instances of of bilateral vest vestibular schwannomas. Uh, that's another term for it. Um, but, you know, uh, sometimes hearing aids can work on, on, on the injured side, sometimes not. But uh, if the hearing loss is impacting, you know, your ability to communicate, uh, you really need to get it checked out. And, and again, I want to really reiterate is um, if you're going to get your hearing checked, don't feel nervous about having to get a hearing aid i think if you don't want a hearing aid just just say you don't want one um but i really think it's worth getting checked out and getting some additional information i think there's a lot of people out there that could benefit john why do you what do you hear about why people say they don't want a hearing aid um well there's a lot of so that, that, meg that kind of goes back into the desperation part right so if you if if you feel if you have a hearing loss and you feel that you can get by without a hearing aid, then it's 
you're probably not going to want a hearing aid or when you go get them they're just going to end up in the drawer because you you feel like you can get by well enough in terms of your communication right so say if somebody comes in with a mild to moderate hearing loss uh, um, they're having trouble hearing in background noise certain situations right they're having trouble hearing in background noise or the tv is a bit loud um, they come in to have their hearing checked um, there is a hearing loss but there's just not quite to that desperation part right um, hearing loss to me is the biggest part of hearing loss to me is the communication deficit and that's what hearing aids hearing aids um help right so the ideal candidate is a person with a mild to moderate hearing loss uh who's really needs something to help them communicate who's really struggling who's really fatigued uh and and that's where hearing aids can kind of come in come in handy so would that person be um would desperate be past that stage um yes yes okay so yeah you, you know it's exactly okay um, Shirley White asks, does a person need a referral from a doctor to get a public health hearing test? I and many others don't have a family doctor here in Labrador. Um, they can uh, get a referral or they can self refer. Okay. Yeah, which would be on, um, I'm not sure in Labrador, but Eastern Health, you can self refer. refer. But the, the primary entry point, yes, is, is the referral from the doctor. Uh, but if I don't have a doctor, I can self-refer. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Cal Carter says that CHHANL um, provides information and hearing tests at no cost to clients as well. That's a great service. Um, and the Canadian Heart and Hearing Association, are, they're fantastic. I've worked very closely with them. Um, they have a lot of great information about uh, hearing loss, a lot of great information about how to cope with your hearing hearing loss in everyday life. Uh, they have a lot of great information on uh, other um, symptoms of hearing loss, like tinnitus or being able to, you know, lip read, that kind of thing. But I really feel that if you're going to get your hearing tested, it should be done by an audiologist. Okay. Um, can you speak to opportunities to lease or rent to own hearing aids? Some people don't have the cash to hand out, but maybe can manage monthly payments. Exactly. Um, so, in, you know, that, you know, I'm sure there are arrangements that can be done through private clinics for that. I don't know if every private clinic would offer that option. Um, my advice with private clinics is, is, is do some shopping around. Um, you should never pay any more than you know, $4,500 for a set of hearing aids. Uh, to me, that would be the maximum price that I would ever suggest anybody pay for. Um, that would get you a good mid-level hearing aid that I think would, uh, you know, help you hear better as well as any other type of hearing aid. But um, the other important piece is to make sure that you get a trial period. And, and the, the trial period isn't, it's not for you to go out and try it. Like we're, we're not selling used cars here. Um, the trial period is, for you to um, determine if you're going to get hearing aid from the benefit or from it's to protect the consumer. So if you don't get benefit from the hearing aid, then that trial period is there to protect you and you can bring it back kind of thing. Okay. Um, but yes, just to go back to that point, uh, there are, I'm sure there are arrangements at some private clinics that you can um, do equal payments. You've heard of that? Yes, pretty sure. Okay. Um, also noting that uh, Canadian Hearing um, Association also, also offers speech reading lessons, among other supports for persons who have hearing loss. Fantastic service. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Shirley, is there a fix for tinnitus or constant ticking in one ear? They saw an ENT years ago said there was nothing that could be done, but hoping there might be an advance in technology. If if um, if pharmaceuticals companies could ever find a cure for tinnitus, then that would be the holy grail for them, for sure. Um, tinnitus is a complex cool. issue. Um, it's in, it, you know uh, there is you know I hate to say, put it this way, but there is no there is no simple cure for it for sure. But uh, like there's no pharmaceutical cure right now. 
um, or anything like that. But there are things that can be done about it. Um, you know, if, if you're having trouble, I would uh, suggest that you see an audiologist, uh, not an ENT, um, and ask uh, in person. Um, the other thing you can do is um, Google tinnitus, um, you know, tinnitus help uh, online, but just make sure that you stick to like the, um, uh, the legit websites, right? The Google, the WebMD and audiology websites and that, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, bizarre information out there. But there's a lot of help on the internet too. But so I guess the main takeaway, Meg, is that um, there is there are things to be that can be done about it. So uh, sometimes when you're told that there's nothing that can be done about it, that makes it worse, right? Uh, but you know, if if you go see an audiologist or even if you Google, uh, you know, a tinnitus help, that can there might be some ideas there. Um, you're starting to see now some some apps. So a lot of um, people find that tinnitus is worse than quiet. Um, so you're starting to find that there are a lot of apps coming out now that, um, you know, play background noise just to, just to take your mind off of it and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, I live with autosclerosis thought to be inherited. Can you please speak to the life of hearing aids? It is extremely costly. And when you begin wearing them at 45 ish, it's a lot of money over a lifetime. Some people think a set will last forever. So they are shocked to realize that they have a shelf life. That's a great question. And, you know, that's, um, that's the unfortunate part about how the hearing aid system is set up right now. Um, expect someone to go through life at 45 and to pay, you know, up, sometimes it can be upwards of $6,000 every five years for a new set of hearing aids. Um, you know, that gets certainly expensive. Um, and, and it's really unfair, I think. But um, in terms of the shelf life piece, uh, I tell my patients that I don't really replace the hearing aids until they're broken and out of out of warranty. So um, you can get you can get by ten or twelve years with a set of hearing aids as long as they're working for you. I think. Excellent. Um, well, that's all the questions in chat. So I'm wondering if anybody wants to ask any questions directly. You can open your mic. We still have some time. Any questions, anyone? No? Okay. I am just going to share. Okay, well, John, thank you. You're welcome. That was an amazing amount of information. Um, so the good news is, everyone, that this has been recorded. And um, John, you'll, uh, hopefully you'll share your slides with us so that we can share that with everybody as well. So as soon as we have the recording up and ready to go, then we'll send out an email to everybody um, with those included. And, um, and maybe uh, some additional info to follow with regards to alternatives that might be out there for people. That would be great. Um, if anybody needs a certificate, I know that uh, several of you indicated that upon registration. Um, don't hesitate to reach out and send an email to Mary E at seniorsnl.ca. If you need it for professional development, we will be happy to send that along. Uh, <laughs> Excellent presentation, John. Really good. Really good information. Thank you. Uh, and thanks very much for having me. And I know there was a lot there, but, um, you know, I hope that there are a few good takeaways there that, uh, that can be useful for everybody. Very, very good information. Um, and just one last thing, if anybody wants to be a friend of Seniors NL, um, that's an opportunity to connect um, people that you know with Seniors NL for information that might be able to improve the quality of their lives. We would provide you with custom business cards so that you can make that connection between that person that you know in your life with an information and, re uh, information and referral service through Seniors NL. Anybody can be one, send us an email, Mary E at seniorsnl.ca. And again, the phone number is 
or 800-563-5599. And on that note, we, uh, we're done. Thank you, John. That was Thank amazing. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you, really good information from Wanda Collins. Excellent presentation from Marion. I've learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. See ya.